actually knows events like the back of her hand because she's also an event planner. <laughs> All right, so it's two o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you all for joining us. We want to go ahead and get started on time so we can respect everyone's time. I want to welcome you all to the first coffee break. Um, it's a interview segment where we are interviewing um, event professionals who are trailblazing in our industry, who have put in an astound, outstanding amount of years in our industry, and who exudes good work, professionalism, and we just love, love, love them. And so we know plenty of them, and we want to make sure that we're highlighting them in their business. And so today on our segment, we have Miss Christy Nick Williams. Um, she is the owner of Nick Williams Events. And she also is celebrating 10 years. So kudos to her. Congratulations to her. Um, so how are you? Tell us how you are. What's going on? Hello, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am so honored to be your first speaker for the coffee break. Thank you. Um, how am I doing? I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's it's as, as best as we can be doing. Um, like you, I miss going out to dinner yeah. and, you know, the hair salon and, you know, just trying to maintain these eyebrows. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. And um, I am team. I'm not going anywhere on Friday when the city starts to open up. So I'm on exactly. that team. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And welcome, Les and Kristen. Thank you all for um, adding into the chat as well. Um, okay, so it's good to hear you're doing great. I'm so not going anywhere on Friday either. So it's good to know you're still practicing <laughs> distancing. Absolutely. Um, Right. So tell us a little bit more about who Christy is, why she started in event planning, um, and how the business started. Okay, absolutely. So I started, um, I became interested in wedding planning and planning my own wedding. 2006, I got married. And after my wedding, it was something that I really missed doing. And so I started helping family and friends with different events and activities and then I just, I, I really love doing it. And so after a while, I went ahead and started Nick Williams events. And um, that was officially 10 years ago this year um, from the day that we actually um, incorporated our business and um, been doing it full time now for, for nine years. Awesome. Um, and it's really, it's really something that I love doing. And I knew that it would be something that I would enjoy and that it would be a career and not just a hobby when it, I felt like it was something that I would do for free. I'm yeah. not going to do it for free, but <laughs> when I felt like it was something that I would do uh, for free, I knew that it would be the career for me. Okay, good stuff. So speaking of doing it full time, mm -hmm. um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have been uh, full time for how long? How many years have you been full time doing your business outside of corporate? Nine years. Nine years. And what let you know, like, hey, this is it. Like, I'm all both feet in, hands, body, all in the water. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not going back to corporate. I'm leaving corporate and I'm doing this thing full time. When was that transition? Well, it actually, you know, for, for my corporate life, I mean, I made them a lot of money. I mean, I, I had a six figure salary and so I was well paid, but I made them a lot of money as well. And with the skills that I had, um, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in English and combine that with my corporate training and, and corporate sales and meeting with CFOs and um, managing clients from domestically and internationally um, and just, just really building relationships all over the world. It really um, gave me the the education and the tools that I needed to to do to build something for myself yeah and so um there came a point in my corporate career and I'll, I'll give you the short version to where there were some higher ups who I felt like weren't on my team meaning um they were new and they were trying to get some of the top earners out of there 
And so I actually, um, I felt like at that time I said, okay, I have the tools, I have the skills. There's something else that I love doing. And my husband fully supported me. And I said, let's just, let's just go do it. Let's do it. I mean, I started out part-time of course, and, and helping people and, um, then my first client, I think I maybe charged like $500 Mm -hmm. and, um, then we just, we just grew from there. And then when the business became steady, I took the leap. Good, good stuff. So speaking of taking a leap, I know that um, maybe some small business owners or, you know, moderate business owners are having trouble with quitting corporate right now during the COVID pandemic and wishing that maybe they would have waited to quit corporate. Do you ever have those moments during this COVID-19? Has it impacted your business so much that you're like, dang, I wish that I would have stayed in corporate or I never would have seen this coming or, or, you know, something like that. I can definitely understand um, someone feeling like they wish they would have stayed in corporate during these times. Um, It's definitely um, difficult times. I, um, I personally have never felt like I wish I wouldn't have left, (laughs) (laughs) but that's just me personally. Um, I've, I've, I've always felt good about that decision. Um, Now there's been a mental adjustment, um, you know, because I don't have a regular paycheck coming in and especially now with COVID, with some things slowing down, um, it's really been all about pre-planning. You, you need to build your business for times like this. And when you're able to do that, to plan and to prepare so that you can still handle payroll and office rent and office electric and all of that good stuff when you're able to pre-plan for that and uh, because you never know what's going to happen um Mm -hmm. you don't know if those invoices are always going to be paid and so i think it's all about pre-planning and to answer your question um I, i completely respect those who feel like they may not uh may shouldn't shouldn't have left um but i personally don't feel that way Good. Good to know. Okay. So tell me if there was, which there are seven of them probably on this call, if there was someone who is desiring to be in your shoes and to have a business standing for 10 years um, and nine years out of corporate, what would you tell them? What would be your biggest piece of advice to give them? Mm, I would say you know, we really try to, um, we really try to live by six components. Um, well, I, I personally try to run Nick Williams events by, by six components. Um, first to dream always, you know, dream big, um, make your dreams known, write them down, um, pray about them. Yes. And, and while you're praying, you need to have faith have faith that those dreams are going to come to fruition, but you definitely have to put the work in. And so you also have to educate yourself. Um, Although I've been doing this for 10 years, I'm constantly taking classes and attending workshops. You can never learn too much. There are always new things to learn. Um, On top of that, I would say discipline. You know, even when I worked in corporate, I worked from home. And so I had that foundation Um, for being a a business owner with a flexible schedule, but it's difficult when you have a flexible schedule and you, there's so many things that you could be be doing, but you have to run your business. So you have to have Mm -hmm. discipline in order to get up in the morning. You know, I don't have to be at my office at nine o'clock, but I do what I need to do, get there and get my work done and come back home and live a regular life like everyone else. Now I do get to choose what days I wanna go into the office. And so the flexibility is wonderful, Um, but you'll also um, need to persevere because there may be hard times. There has been a time in our business where we weren't sure if we were going to make the rent, especially in our um, earlier years. And so no matter what, you just keep pushing forward and you keep working the plan. Don't let the plan work you. Come on, don't let the plan work you. (laughs) Okay. So I 
know that you talked about making sure that you have faith in your business. Was there ever a time in your business where you felt extremely challenged and you really just didn't know like how you were going to get out of this moment or you didn't think the business was going to succeed after this moment? Mm. Um, I would say, you know, there, every single client, I would say, presents a challenge. Um, and I say that because every single client has their own set of expectations. And we have to adapt to their personality and do what we need to do to exceed their expectations. Yeah. Under promise, over deliver. And so we try to really live by that. There have been a couple of times that we haven't. And in those times, yes, I'm frustrated. I'm about in tears. <laughs> and I'm like, my business is going to close and this, that, and the other. I have felt that way before. But once again, you got to pull yourself together. Yeah. Put your big girl pants on. Stay prayed up and just push through. Just really persevere. So was prayer like one of your things that kind of helped you stay grounded? Is there any other... Um, maybe self-care tips that you would give to anyone who is in our industry and is kind of having trouble making sure they stay focused and they have that tunnel vision. What keeps you grounded? I say what um, I'd say what keeps me grounded is definitely um, definitely prayer, um, my family and my friends. I have other friends who are entrepreneurs and sometimes we just get together and yeah. just powwow, um, drop business ideas on one another and advise one another, pray for one another. Um, you need that network. Um, and so I would say with, with family and friends who are supportive and prayer and, um, those, those would pretty much be the elements that I would say that really keep me going. So, which leads me to my next question. I know, honestly speaking, I've had so many people in business consultations um, say that one of their largest challenges was balancing personal life, whether it's with family, friends, a husband, children, and making sure that they still give their all to their business, along with some people maybe still working corporate full-time or part-time, right? They feel right. like it's a lot on their plate. They feel like they don't have enough time. And mm -hmm. so they're trying to figure out how do I juggle all of this and still make sure my husband is happy and my children feel like I'm paying them attention. So to your testament, how have you um, kind of gotten through that or have you had any challenges in juggling both? Well, when I first started out in this industry, I was a little bit reluctant at first because I didn't want to give up all of my weekends because in the event industry, most of what we do is on the weekends. Absolutely. And then it occurred to me, you can make the schedule. Mm -hmm. If you don't <laughs> want to work this particular weekend, then don't. It's all about pre-planning. Now, do I miss some of the fun gatherings and birthday parties and special events sometimes because I have an event pre-booked? Yes, sometimes I do. That's just part of the business. But if you plan ahead, then you can still enjoy life. You can still enjoy your weekends. Yeah. Um, and when I have when I have a weekend off, I either do absolutely nothing so that I can rejuvenate. Or my husband and I are, are go off somewhere. Um, my son's a little older, so I don't have to worry about, you know, him being small and, and child care, things of that nature. But we, we I, I think I do pretty good in getting my family time in and my time for myself. Uh, we're closed on Sundays and Mondays. And that is very important to me because we need that time to ourselves. Now, of course, if we have an event on Sunday, it is what it is. Then we're just closed on Monday. But we have to recuperate. You know, I don't feel like you can run a business seven days a week and be your best self. Yeah. Um, I know some people who do it. I just feel like for my personal mental health, I'm not going to do it. I know that I've had some business owners that are like, well, I was encouraged by other 
um, consultants that I should work 24 seven and, you know, it should be no days off and no sleep in the early stages of my business. How was the first couple of years out of corporate? Was it where you were working all the time, 24 seven, you kind of forgot that you needed to make dinner or whatever that looks like. Was there any challenges with you trying to structure your schedule and how did you get through that? Well, absolutely. Early on. And even now, sometimes I work super long and super late hours. You know, sometimes I'm on email at one and two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not I'm not saying that you're not going to have those long days. I just don't feel like it should be every day. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, it's perfectly OK if you're up, then OK, answer your emails in the middle of the night. Absolutely. Um, if you want to get in and I'll admit even being closed on Monday. Sometimes if I'm absolutely doing nothing, then I will hop on my email right quick. So I'm not saying don't, you know, work your business or ignore clients over a two day period. I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, you still have to make time for yourself and make time for your family. I mean, it's natural every now and then you're going to be deep in your work and you may not be able to cook. You may have to order in, you know, or you may have to, if you have a spouse, you may have to ask them to cook. And hopefully you'll have someone that is supportive enough to assist you with that. Um, that I think that a supportive spouse is definitely very important and helpful in the growth of your business. And if you're, if you're not married, then you can, like I said, order out. You don't have to order out. You can, you don't have to cook every day, make a sandwich right quick. You know, if you have, if you have little ones and you're a single parent, the kids don't care if they have a three, four course meal, they don't care about that at all. You give them a peanut butter sandwich, bathe them, get them in the bed and keep it pushing. I know for sure our senior um, consultant, she works best late, late, late at night. And so sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and she's popped me like five or six emails and I'm like, okay, but she has little ones. And so you have to adjust your life towards your family. For sure. I think it's important to uh, create those boundaries around mm -hmm. when you are willing to work, what your schedule would be like. And if you yourself decide to work on those days and that's fine, but I think that you should create the boundaries for your clients and your staff so that you can have that self-care time and so forth from there. I know when I first started, I um, worked better at night as well. Mm -hmm. And now I'm a, a, doing a little bit better <laughs> working <laughs> during the day because mm -hmm. I realized that if I send the client something at two in the morning, then they kind of think that I should answer at two in the morning as well moving forward. So it's about Absolutely. setting that tone, right? Mm -hmm. and, right. and making sure that it, it works out. So, um, which leads me to my next question before we actually break off and get into questions that were submitted. Okay. Um, have you ever had a client you needed to fire yourself from and how did you create those boundaries? Okay, there, there's been, um, there's been a couple of situations I can think of. Um, so we had a situation where someone wanted us to change our contract, contract. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, it was a few sentences in the contract that they really were adamant that we take out and I don't care how great or how big the contract is. If taking out those sentences are going to potentially harm your business, you cannot adjust. You cannot remove those elements from the contract. For no sure. client is worth it. I absolutely, I, I love all of our clients, but if you can't respect my contract, then we can't work together. And so for that reason, um, it's happened a couple of times to where I've had to decline the client because they wanted to make that adjustment. Um, we, we also had a situation to where a particular client, um, it wasn't, we've never had any personality issues, but, um, this particular client, I just, I didn't feel like she was ethical. It just, it just, it didn't mm -hmm. feel. So, you know, after going back and forth about a couple of different things over about a week and a half period, I just told her I didn't think that we would be a good fit. 
And so, you know, in our business, you have to be honest with yourself. Every dollar is not a good dollar. And so, um, <laughs> and so uh, we haven't had the experience of working with a, we have not had the experience of working with a client and then we had to sever the relationship due to, due to something on our end. Um, but right before signing, we've just had that situation a few times. And I think that you can say like, hey, that has been, you haven't had those issues because you learned how to choose the client that was right for you. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. And identify who your target audience is. And so mm -hmm. I think that when you figure out who that is, then it's easier to say, hey, yes or no, this person is not going to work for me. And when you're so confident in business, and I love what you said, like, hey, we're just not a good fit. And it's okay to say that. And a lot of business owners don't think that you can say that, right? They're really afraid. I know me when I first started years ago, I was just like, I can't say no to anyone. I have to book these <laughs> clients, right? I got to get money. And mm -hmm. they're going to be like, well, she didn't want me as a client. And I, I realized over time, like every client isn't your client, right? Every right. dollar isn't a good dollar, like you said. And so that's super, super true and super important. Um, okay, so I want to get into the questions that were submitted from the people that originally signed up. Um, people that are on the chat, if you want to say that it's your question or you want to ask additional questions, you are more than welcome to do that. We will ask them anonymously first and you have the right to add on to a question as you so choose. Um, so the first question was, what is the biggest tip you can give to wedding designers? I would say the biggest tip that I can give to wedding designers is to be open-minded. Um, you know, there are so many different ways to be creative and you can help your clients event just really feel elevated in like a true experience if you allow yourself to be open-minded. Um, I would also say you don't necessarily have to follow trends. Um, yeah, now, some yeah. of the clients are very adamant about specific things. There are things that they've seen that they just absolutely love. And then so as a, as a designer, you'll find yourself repeating certain things. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, all designers, you know, neither one, none of us want to do that. And so um, we just have to find a way to make the client happy, but to also introduce the client to new things. Very well put. <laughs> it's a very well, it's a very good way to say like, hmm, your idea may not be that great, but let me show you how I can make it better. And that's, that's the purpose right. of hiring you as a wedding designer, honestly. Yes. That's right. Okay, so our next question was, how should brides uh, be proactive during this pandemic? So this is this is really an uncertain period for for everybody. Um, the first thing I'll say is, if you feel extremely uncomfortable with keeping your current date, you should immediately postpone it. Don't cancel because I don't know of any vendors that are giving refunds, but go ahead and postpone it because it's just gonna make you anxious. You're gonna lose sleep. Um, and so, you know, go ahead and try to grab another date because so many people are postponing. Um, dates are becoming very limited in 2020. Um, we have postponed several events um, for later 2020 and for uh, and into 2021. And so if you're just feeling completely uncomfortable, postpone ASAP. Um, but when you do that, not only do you need to check with the venue, you need to also check with all of your other vendors as well. I've heard of a couple of situations to where people are postponing their weddings and they haven't checked with everyone. They haven't checked with the cake designer to make sure they don't have 15 cakes in that particular day and therefore cannot service exactly. them. Or they have not checked with the photographer, videographer, or even the designer. And so they've just went ahead and changed their date and that just causes more problems. And so if you have a planner, the planner should be checking with all of your vendors first to ensure you're all on the same page and that you all can um, handle that they all can handle your your wedding on the new date. 
Um, and if you don't have a planner, then it's something you're going to have to take on yourself, but you have to check with all of the vendors. Um, if you're not sure if you want to postpone, it's okay to feel that way as well. Um, I think that if you have not mailed your invitations, that when you mail the invitations, put a little note in your invitation that reads um, something like, you know, due to COVID-19, we may end up postponing our wedding. Please check our wedding website on this particular date, and we will inform you if the date has been postponed. In the meantime, please RSVP, and let's plan to have an amazing time together. Something along those lines. And so proceed with your plans, but then have a backup plan in your um, and have a plan, a, a plan B, excuse me, a plan B in the back of your mind. Um, like one of the things that we've done for a couple of our clients is they're like, OK, can you go ahead and check with the venue and see what dates they have available in these two or three particular months? Now, yeah. when I find that information out, that is for that particular day, because the day could be taken at any moment. But at least we've started the conversation. And yeah. so. Just be true to your own feelings and do what you feel is best. But I don't think um, I, I would encourage the brides and grooms out there not to feel like their day is canceled. The day is going to come. It's just postponed a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. We've had so many brides that, you know, were really upset about having to postpone and reschedule. And it, you do have to we have to serve as a counselor, as planners we wear many hats um and so we have to serve as that person that says hey it's coming it's just not coming the exact date that you wanted it to come um so crystal has a follow-up question to that that actually was her question um and she says what about those who choose a day of coordinators should their planner reach out i think if the um if the client just hired a day of week of month of coordinator um which they're all very different um, I don't think I don't think it's possible to have a day of coordinator uh, with so much involved in in a wedding. But um, I understand the question basically is if the person is not maybe if I, if I understand it correctly if the person doesn't have a full service planner should Correct. that coordinator be reaching out. Normally, I would say with um, like a month of coordinator that that would not necessarily be something that the coordinator would handle. But under these circumstances, um, because this is such a sensitive time and the clients are already very emotional, I would definitely suggest whether you're day of, week of, or month of to go ahead and handle contacting the vendors for that particular client. Absolutely. And I think that it streamlines the process for you, right? It kind of starts the opening the door to say, hey, I am the coordinator and let me go ahead and start coordinating what this could look like moving forward mm -hmm. instead of just waiting and having to decide or pick a date and so forth from there. So I think that it could be beneficial to you as well. I mean, is it helpful for them and their sanity? For sure, but it could be beneficial to you as the, the coordinator to kind of stay abreast of what, of all, what all the changes are. Right. Um, okay, so we had another submitted uh, question and it how do you come up with the color scheme for your clients um, and how do you avoid using generic color schemes or trendy color schemes? Oh, that's so hard. Everybody <laughs> loves the same colors. Blush, 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 blush. Blush is absolutely beautiful, um, but it is definitely overused. Yeah. I would say, you know, in, in coming up with color schemes for different events, um, the clients a lot of times will have a color scheme in mind. Um, very rarely is there a time where the client just doesn't know what route they want to go as far as colors. Um, but what we try to do is help them along the way. Um, and when I say that, I just mean sometimes we have people that are very adamant about specific colors, but there's an element that missing that's missing. Like I firmly believe that all color palettes should also have a metallic, whether it's gold or silver. Um, and some mm -hmm. people you know, don't necessarily agree with that, but I'm, I'm pretty adamant about it. Um, 
there are um, some times where people will come to you with just like one main color, like red. I just want red, yeah. red. And that's perfectly fine that you love red, but it should be complemented with something like maybe put champagne with it or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, our company, Nick Williams, Boots, we actually create design proposals to where you can see the color combinations together. And I think that if you give the client a visual, then that will help them decide or, or um, approve a color palette. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Our next submitted questions is what are the challenges with planning events for non-local clients? Mm, I love traveling for events outside of Metro Atlanta. Me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's always a lot of fun. Um, I would say the biggest, well, not the biggest, I would say um, definitely staffing. Um, we have a large team, so we're blessed in that way. Um, transporting materials, um, that's, that's something that you need to think about and how you're going to transport those materials. Um, you need some sort of team local to where you're going. And yeah. so, I mean, you, you can't bring everything with you. Like wherever you're going, you need to have a, 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 a floral wholesaler. Um, you know, so that when you get there, you know, they've, they've, they have your order. Um, and when you get there, you just have to design. And so, um, I think that that's actually one of the, one of the bigger things, um, because the people, the locals, they know other local vendors. And mm -hmm. so you kind of need to build your little network. Um, in the area that your that your event is going to take place, I think that's very important. Um, you also have to be careful though, because you have to make sure that they are going to have the they they're not always going to have the same expectation or or urgency that you would have with your particular client, and so you have to be careful with that as well. So when you're traveling for an event, you have to bring your A, B, and C game. Right. So <laughs> got to check all the boxes. For sure. Right. Ab yeah. Absolutely. And it's really all about pre-planning. I mean, you have to plan everything down to the hour of, of exactly what's going to take place. And I'm not even talking about the event. I'm talking mm -hmm. about planning everything down to the uh, hour as far as, you know, what time are you leaving? What time are you arriving? What time is this delivery going to happen? What do you need to pick up? From what store do you need to pick it up? Who was going to pick it up? How are they going to pick it up? Well, how is so-and-so going to drive if it's two different locations? How uh, How is the couple going to get from this place to that place? I mean, all of that. And so, um, you know, pre-parties for welcoming guests. I mean, all of that good stuff. It's just a lot, but it's really all about pre-planning. Um, I'll try to be brief, but we had a situation once, I won't go into great detail, to where the wedding was in Florida, oceanfront wedding, and um, we actually got there and the client had not paid their full bill to the venue. Yeah. And they canceled, the client couldn't pay the bill, so the venue canceled it. And we had to plan an entirely different wedding with what money the client had in less than 48 hours. You talking about challenging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a whole nother story in itself, oh, but we were able to get it done and that bride and groom still had a wedding. Shout out to you and your team for that. <laughs> for, first, because... <laughs> You know, to, and I think about, I think in such great detail. So I think when someone tells me a story like that, I'm thinking about all the things you had to do within a 48 hour span to get something mm -hmm. accomplished like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard and it's difficult. And so my hat goes off to you and your team for, you know, making that event successful for sure. Amongst all the other events that you've made successful. Well, thank you. Um, Les says as a follow up, Hold on. Sorry, I had to switch over my screen. As a follow-up, the convo around traveling, any advice for how to charge for travel expenses, gas, flights, food accommodations, food and accommodations? We have a process, but interested in tips for improving it. And so um, I have some tips as well, but Nick, I'm going to let you go first. 
and then if you don't say all of mine, then I'll chime in. But go ahead first. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. The client should pay for it. The client should pay for all of that. That should not come out of a planner or a designer's pocket, designer's pocket at all. And so it's up to you to, you know, look up the costs of accommodations, flights, um, what is considered to be a fair per diem um, on a daily basis for you and your team. And you add up all of that cost. And what we personally do is we include it in our fee. I don't like the client to feel like I'm nickel and diamond them to death with 50 line items, but that's just me personally. You can operate your business, of course, however you feel. But we add up all, add up all of those numbers and we make it one fee. And that's, that's how we present it. I think that's uh, great. I think that's fair to make it one fee. It, it mm -hmm. takes away the overwhelming part for when they're looking at an invoice and they're like, oh, and, and this and this and this, right? And so I think that's good advice. What I would tell you, Les, is that, um, like Christy just said, no, you shouldn't pay for any of those things. Um, some people do it as far as gas. Um, they do it to where they are getting their mileage first and then they're invoicing them on the back end for the mileage the issue with that becomes the nickel and diming aspect right when people are done with their wedding they want to be done paying and that's it so i do agree that maybe you should figure out how much all of those things could cost for you gas food how many team members and the challenge is a lot of us are so eager to perch I mean, to go ahead and get the client that we don't even research those things before providing them with a quote and right. so if you're not already telling them, hey, because yours is not local, give me some time to research the, where it is, if I'm going to have to fly or drive. And it also depends on the service. If I'm doing design, then I also have to figure out how to get some of my stuff there. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. it's not just clothes, mm -hmm. right? And if I'm doing day of coordination, then it's clothes. And so it's a little bit less to lug. And so I think that you should, for non-local events, you should for sure make sure that you're giving yourself enough time to do the research, like Christy just said, but also to really think about how much of your team has to come to produce this service. Absolutely. And I, and I want to add something um, to that as well. One of the things that we've really found helpful is when a venue will allow us to ship some items in advance. And so, um, you know, all of them won't, you know, there's some that just won't allow it, but you should definitely ask. Um, we've really been successful in shipping linen in advance, linen is heavy. And yeah. so and so if you can have that shipped directly to the venue, then that's always helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so Liz, I hope that answered your question. We have our last question and it's, if there was one thing you would change about our industry, what would that be and why? Um, I would say that in the event industry, I feel like we should be more open. You know, I think that people try to hoard knowledge and people don't really like to share. Um, yeah. And I think that no matter what advice you give someone or however you try to help educate someone, they're not going to steal what you're doing because they can't do it like you. You are who you are, and that person, they're going to take whatever piece of advice you give them, and they're going to do with it what they know how to do and in their own way. And so I wish that the industry was a little bit more open to sharing. Um, also, I used to feel like the industry was very cliquish, but I felt like the Atlanta market has gotten a little bit better with that. Um, I felt, I, I kind of felt like, you know, we were divided by race or, or the type of client that we work with. Um, just, just a really big division in those areas. Um, when in all honesty, we all go through the same thing, you know, yeah, whether yeah. it's a six figure budget or a five figure budget, it, you know, we, we go through the same thing and we can all have um, that same conversation about 
our clients. Um, and then if there's some, you know, of course, with six-figure weddings, there are some things that um, five-figure weddings don't have or you know like there may be a writer because they have special entertainment you know but it's okay to have that conversation around a person who does you know weddings that are not so high end because you're teaching them something i mean we all need to glow up together that's how i feel absolutely i have myself before we go over to marcella's question i actually have a sub question to add on to that i recently had a consultation with a uh, event planner um mm -hmm. I'm trying to refrain from saying so many details, but yes, I had a conversation with an event planner and mm -hmm. her challenge was that she signed a um, non-compete form when she was working with someone in Atlanta and basically mm -hmm. told her over the next three years that you couldn't do business in this city um, and you couldn't use her photos. And so my question for you would be, because I know that you talked about it being clickish and also um, them wanting to hoard information and, show, and so forth from there. How do you feel about non-compete forms? And also, how do you feel about uh, when you hire people up under you? What are those stipulations or boundaries that you're setting for the people that's on your team? So I don't have a problem with non-competes. I think that, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a non-compete, but I think it should be fair. Um, I think that you know, as a business owner, when we invest so much time and energy and knowledge into our team, and I love sharing with my team and, and my team growing with me, I've been very blessed. Our average team member has been with us for over five years. Yeah. And so I'm very blessed in that way. Um, but I do feel like it's not okay for that team member to take everything that I've taught you and go open up a business down the street. Yeah. So I, I don't think that's okay. So our company, we actually do have a non-compete as well, but it's for a year and it's a, it's within a certain number of miles from our Norcross office. And so if you want to, on the other side of Georgia or Texas or what have you, if you want to go ahead and start something up after you've left our company, then I don't have a problem with that. Or if you want to do something else in our industry that's not in exact competition with what it is that we're doing. I don't have a problem with that. I want to see people on my team grow and, and, and do their own thing. But at the same token, I don't think it's fair for those people to be my direct competition immediately, you know, after working for me either. Okay. I hope I answered the question. You did. <laughs> okay. Fair okay. enough. Okay. So we're going to go to Marcella's question. Um, her question is, what is the best way to find the right lawyer so you don't find out months or a year later the lawyer you picked isn't actually right for your company? So before you answer that, uh, Christy, I do want to let everyone know at this time we are opening up the chat room for any questions. So if you want to ask any questions that maybe I did not cover or something that you really want to know from Christy or about her business, please feel free to go ahead and load up the, <laughs> the chat with that now. We're going to take a couple minutes and answer some of your questions that you may have additional to the ones we had. And then we will close out the chat um, and you'll find out more information about Christy. So I'm going to eat, read Marshayla's question for you one more time. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to find the right lawyer so you don't find out months or a year later the lawyer you picked isn't actually right for your company? I would say um, references. Um find out who they've worked with. Um, if it's not in our exact industry, maybe something similar. Um, sometimes you'll find at different speaking engagements that sometimes they'll have attorneys that will speak at event planning um, workshops. I think that's a good way to find um, a good lawyer for your business. Um, and also sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's just a vibe. Yeah. Um, think that when you when you talk with them and just really try to fill out that uh, attorney's personality, um, their level of honesty and, um, you know, kind of really talking about how you can partner um, yeah. as your business grows. I for sure would take advantage of the free consultations if they have them. I think that most most business attorneys that I've seen have free consultations where you can go in and ask all the questions that you need. Right from there and that time isn't just for you for them to see if you're a good fit for them but you know vice versa and so take advantage of that time 
Um, and think about why you really want a lawyer. Do I want a lawyer just to review my contracts and make sure I'm in line and everything is fine, I'm protected? Or do I want a lawyer who's ongoing, who if something pops up and happens, I can call them? What, do, what exactly do I want a lawyer for? And then that'll help you better narrow down your search. Right. Would you agree, Christy? Absolutely. I agree. Great advice. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So we are taking more questions. If you all want to ask some at this moment, we're going to take about five minutes um, to answer any questions that you have and you can put them in the chat now. And in the meantime, um, Christy, if you want to tell us um, how you celebrated your 10 years um, what you did or what you're doing still, right? <laughs> <laughs> and anything else that's new that's going on with your business that we should know about? Well, um, like Brittany said, we celebrated 10 years in business this year. Um, it is an amazing feeling to be doing something that you love for 10 years. Yeah. And, and so I wanted a celebration, but I didn't want something, you know, I didn't want something very typical. I didn't want a dinner party or, you know, I didn't, I didn't want just a regular party. And so I came up with the idea of a glow party. I wanted to do a glow in the dark party. And so I said, okay, the glow up celebrating 10 years in business. And so I absolutely drove me and my team nuts coming up <laughs> with different things that, you know, glow in the dark and black light and UV yeah, reactive. Yeah. I learned way more than that about that stuff than I needed to know. Um, but um, that's what we end up doing. Um, we invited our past clients, current clients, um, frienders, and um, people that, you know, we have relationships with in the industry. Um, the unfortunate part is the day that we had our celebration was really like the day after things really went south as far as the virus. And so many people who RSVP did not attend, but we still had a decent turnout and we still had a really, really good time. We danced, we had a live drum line, um, glow in the dark drinks. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a really good time. Good. I'm glad you so deserve it. I'm so happy that y'all had a good time in Thank the midst you. of COVID probably messing up plans, but I'm so happy that you had a good time for sure. And, you know, I couldn't cancel because it was like everything was done. It was it was yeah. set up and it was done. And then it came down. Was it? I think it was the day before, like the night before is where it came down. They were like, OK, it's in the United States. And, you know, the cases are growing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but you know what? We pressed forward. Um, nobody, nobody caught the Rona from my party. So thank God for that. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have an, another question. Um, Kavya says, if you are just starting out and I need insurance for just one event, should I cancel the insurance after until I need it or keep paying for it? Um, if you need it for just one event, um, then I would just get it for the one event so you don't have to go back and forth for with the with the canceling and everything um there are different companies out there that offer it just for one day for like 125 150 dollars yeah um but even in just starting out um i would still really look into getting a policy and maintaining it um because you are going to need it and there are some venues that won't even allow you to work there if you don't have insurance and I'm not, I'm not just talking about um, design either. Um, even if you're the planner, some venues won't allow you to work there without insurance. So I would definitely consider um, maintaining your insurance. For sure. Um, I do know that there are some companies that when your client gets the insurance, it also insures the planner or the coordinator. Like if they pay or they get a certain program, um, they it ensures the planner and the coordinator as well. And so I would look into some of those if it's an event that's coming later. Um, and it can be just for that one event. She may be paying monthly leading up if it's for a wedding. 
So just kind of keep that in mind too, that it can be a dual package and maybe that way you can pay a little bit less. Okay, so any other questions for you all? In the meantime, Nick, if you could um, tell us where they can find you, any new updates um, or anything that you may need from them. Um, but where can they keep in touch with you and uh, focus on what's going on in your business? I would say the best way to keep in touch with us is through our social media, uh, mainly our Instagram account, which is at Nick Williams Events, N-I-Q Williams Events with an S. Um, through our um, Instagram page, we, you know, we try to stay up to date with our pictures. Um, I would say that we... <clears throat> excuse me, any specialty um, announcements that we have, um, we usually will post on Instagram. Um, like right now, we are hiring. We are looking for part-time production team members. Um, and on our page, you can see where um, you could submit your resume. Um, we are also working on some upcoming workshops. And so you guys just stay tuned to our Instagram page and you'll um, we'll keep you posted. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chrissy. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I have entered in your website in the chat, and so they should have that as well, as well as your IG information. Um, where can they go? How do they apply for hiring? So you can send your resume to Murdoch W M U R D O C K W at Nick Williams events, NIQ Williams events with an S dot com and include your resume. And in the subject line, hold on one second. We have there's something special I wanted you to put in the subject line. Uh, let's see. In the subject line, put PT Friday. Um, now, I will say this, um, with the help that we're looking for, you have to be available on Friday afternoons. That is an absolute must. Uh, but we are doing interviews on May 29th. And so send us your resume and we'll be in touch so that we can schedule the interview. Perfect. Thank you so much. You are amazing per usual. Um, so you. for everyone else that joined the call, we super appreciate you from the bottom of our heart for joining with us and listening in. This uh, video was recorded and so it's going to be edited down and it's going to be placed on YouTube for those of you that maybe tuned in a little bit late or maybe want to hear it again and kind of really soak in what Christy was saying. And so we will let you all know in an email when it has been posted out to our YouTube channel and kind of keep your abreast. In the meantime, if you can make sure that you are subscribe to the Planners Corner um, to kind of stay tuned with all of our next Coffee Break interviews um, and any other details that we have going on with our event industry. Um, we always share things. We probably send out an email like four times a week at this point. So uh, we want to make sure that you're staying in the loop as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any more questions, you can submit them to Nick, uh, to Nick herself um, or you can email them to me and I'll be happy to send them over to her. So thank you again and have a beautiful day. Thank you, everyone.